Wow, so a lot of people must like squirrels, cool. Well, welcome to the, uh, well, first, Happy New Year to everybody. Welcome to the uh, first uh, CBR seminar of uh, 2023. And what a great way to kick it off. I don't think there's any major announcements other than January the 26th, is that right? January 26th, there's a CBR something. <laughs> New Year's welcome thing in the afternoon, or I think from four until six up in the pod. So everybody's welcome to come. I don't think you have to bring anything, so just yourselves. Um, the uh, Norman Bethune Symposium is already announced as a date set for sometime in April, I believe. And um, the seminar series is um, being kicked off today, and there'll be another one next week, so watch for it. Anyway, so it's uh, my great pleasure to um, introduce Scott Cooper. I met Scott at a Gordon Research Conference, wandering around beer in hand, per usual, um, in the poster session. And I, and, I, and I saw this amazing poster. Uh, I was totally intrigued. I don't know anything about squirrels, except for the squirrels that sort of bounce around my backyard. Um, and he started talking about blood and blood transfusions and blood storage of these um, cold hibernating squirrels. So um, we had a great conversation and I was thrilled that he could visit us. Um, Scott has um, a, a fantastic background um, in history in terms of his training and uh, I don't know anything beyond, before that actually, but he um, is uh, trained in, started his training in Michigan State at um, East Lansing, um, did his um, PhD training at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, and then went to Chapel Hill um, in North Carolina um, to do a postdoc in really in coagulation fibrinolysis um, with mavens of, um, of that field, which many of us, uh, whom many of us know, and he, and he actually did really very well there. But I, I take it he must have been really keen on teaching because then he, um, um, shifted gears a little bit, but continues to do fantastic research. And um, he moved to um, University of Wisconsin La Crosse. And now, and I had to look this up on the map. So it's on the Mississippi, Western um, Wisconsin, uh, probably relatively cold, but no worse than most of Canadian, uh, most parts of Canada aside from here. Um, and um, really almost due west from, I guess, from Madison. Um, and um, and there he does a, a ton of teaching of uh, biology, but it's an undergraduate um, program. So the undergrads do um, uh, most of the research, I take it, um, and they obviously do great research or um, led by a fantastic investigator and teacher. So um, I won't keep, you, keep any more from you because Scott's going to give undoubtedly a terrifically interesting talk. Well, thanks, Ed, and thanks for everyone for coming. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, I'm going to start a timer just so I don't go over time here because I'm not um, in, in the classroom. I always have clocks, so I know when I'm I'm supposed to stop talking or the students the students start rustling their papers and getting up. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to talk to you today about a non-traditional uh, animal model for blood clotting. Uh, and we've been I've been doing research on this for about 15 years now. Um, and these are these 13 lying ground squirrels. So the genus Ictodomus, and then Tridecim lineatus actually means 13 lines. So if you break it down there. Um, and these are uh, ground squirrels that we capture in the wild, but then we can also keep them in the laboratory. And I'll show you, we actually get them to hibernate um, in the lab. And so we can do experiments um, on them. And so we actually catch these at local golf course. Um, that's my wife, Amy. She's our animal caretaker. And we go out. And if you've ever seen um, the movie Caddyshack, um, we look for little gophers popping up. Uh, and then um, you remember Bill Murray from Caddyshack. This is probably way before most of your time. Um, but then we go and capture these squirrels and we bring them back to the lab. And they're about the size of a rat. So we keep them in regular rat uh, cages. Um, and then in the fall, their body temp will start to drop. They start to go into uh, torpor. Um, and so if we temp them here, their body temps about room temps, about 25 degrees. Normally they'd be 37. They'll go down to about 25 degrees. Um, and then we put them in a hibernaculum. So these are uh, little plastic boxes that we put into some restaurant grade refrigerators. And we keep them um, for six months in a refrigerator. Uh, and then when they start waking up in the spring, we bring them back out. Now this might sound cruel, but in Wisconsin, uh, the, they would burrow down underground about three or four feet. So they'd be in a, a dark, tiny little uh, burrow. And um, it would be about four degrees. And so it'd be dark, 
and they wouldn't come back out again until spring when this, the snow melted anyway. So this actually mimics uh, their, in, their native environment uh, pretty, pretty reasonably. Um, and then in the spring, uh, either they wake up on their own or we go and wake them up. So we'd pull them out of the fridge. And um, so their body temp, they'll actually, they're cold. When you pull them out, they're going to feel like you just took a, something cold out of the refrigerator. Um, and so we can weigh them and stuff. They're still kind of curled up in a ball. And then over time, um, they'll start yawning and stretching and waking up. And yeah, so this is them. And in about two hours, they'll go from four degrees to 37 degree body temperature. They have huge brown fat deposits on their back. Um, so they can do a non-shivering thermogenesis. They have these uncoupling proteins they turn on. Um, so they can burn uh, fat without producing ATP and they can generate um, heat from that. So very rapidly, uh, they can warm back up again. Um, so this is a, just kind of a summary of their, um, their cycle. So during the summer, uh, they have a fairly warm body temperature. They're a lot like a rat. Their clotting profiles and everything would be similar to a rat or mouse. Um, they start to go into torpor uh, or into hibernation in the, in the fall, about October. This graph, actually, there should be probably a couple more little zigs up here. Um, they'll kind of start kind of testing themselves out. They would call it uh, uh, ischemic preconditioning. They're kind of getting ready for this low blood flow. Uh, and then during hibernation, we can break it into two parts. They have torpor, which is where their body temp is down here at four degrees. And then about every two weeks, they'll wake back up again. Uh, just for maybe 12 to 16 hours, and then they drop back down. And we're still not totally sure the reason for this. Um, we do, they don't eat or drink the whole time. They don't cash food like a chipmunk or something. Um, so we're not sure exactly what the purpose of the inner bout arousals are, but they're very reproducible um, when we go and do this. And then they would wake back up in the spring. So what got me interested in this um, was that when they're in this torpid state, their body temperature drops but also their heart rate drop. So they go from two to 300 beats per minute to four to five, um, which you would, if you study blood clotting, you would think might put them at risk for something like a deep vein thrombosis. Um, also their blood pressure drops uh, dramatically. Um, and this has been known for quite a while looking at, at these animals. Um, so again, I got interested in this when I was working on blood clotting. I was always interested in comparative physiology as well. Um, and uh, if you're familiar with Burkow's triad, which I'm assuming everybody here is blood clotting people know, um, but one of the things that can predict or, or in, induce um, uh, thrombosis is stasis, right? So the deep vein thrombosis, or if you have atrial fibrillation, uh, you know, blood pooling in the atria and then forming um, clots. So this uh, next slide, I'll summarize 15 years of research, which it's sad I can fit it on one slide. But when we looked at this, actually, my, I've told a couple of people, my first uh, NIH grant that I got on this um, uh, specific aim one was studying primary hemostasis, specific aim two was secondary, and specific aim three was fibrinolysis. So don't ever write a grant with that broad of specific aims. But in this particular case with the squirrels, it hadn't been studied. Um, so this, these were valid specific aims. Um, but this, uh, in, in those experiments and, and others, um, we've been able to show a couple of things. I'm going to show you the summary, and then I'll go back and we'll actually look at the data. So I'm kind of doing a little backwards. But when the animals go into torpor, they induce a very profound thrombocytopenia. Their platelet levels drop tenfold. And we now know that these platelets go into the liver. They're sequestered in the liver. And then when the animals wake back up, within two hours of waking up, the platelets are back in circulation and they remain in circulation. So even though they've been in the cold for several weeks, um, they're still, they come back out, they're circulating around, they don't get rapidly cleared and they're still um, functional. Um, and I'll show you a lot more about platelets here in, in a minute as well. Um, we also know that factors eight and factor nine drop about threefold, and we've shown that von Willebrand's factor drops about tenfold, and I'll come back to those a little bit more as well. So they decrease both primary and secondary um, hemostasis uh, fairly dramatically. These would be basically four different bleeding disorders in a human. They can induce them all and then reverse them again um, fairly rapidly when they wake back up again. Um, they also uh, increase fibrinolysis um, to some extent. And when we've gone to look for organ damage, we haven't found clots in the heart, brain, lungs, anywhere we've looked for these. So the, at the, the final end, even if they have all these things to suppress clotting, break down clots if they do form, and at least physiologically, it seems like it's working, right? We don't, they survive and we don't see even small clots when we go look around. Um, so you can probably run through your brain all the different areas you work in, what the clinical applications would be um, for these. Um, so we could look at ways to inhibit clotting during stasis, um, uh, treat things like hemophilia. But the big one we're, our lab's focused on now um, are cold storage of platelets. So this is me 
um, hooked up to an A-free, so they just did this for the picture, right? Um, but uh, right now, as many of you know, we, when we collect human platelets, um, we have to store them at room temperature. If we store them in the cold, they go through what we call cold storage lesions, which leads, them, leads to them being rapidly cleared. And there's some evidence that they're still, for an, in acute settings, they're probably still fine. You could give them to stop bleeding. So some people are coming back to using cold stored platelets. Um, but it would be really nice to be able to store human platelets in the cold and not have them cleared rapidly. And so there's a big area of research, and I know some uh, individuals here working on that as well. Are there ways we could take these platelets, put them in the cold, and have them still be functional? Um, so we'll start out taking a look at that with uh, primary hemostasis. So just to remind you, their platelet levels drop during torpor, and then they're released back into circulation. Um, and within the platelets themselves, uh, we started just looking at some of the kind of straightforward pro suspects you might expect to play a role in platelet aggregation and adhesion. Um, so we looked at binding to, um, so glycoprotein 1B binding to von Willebrand's factor for adherence, and then uh, 2B3A binding to um, fibrinogen for, um, for aggregation. So this, this would allow uh, these platelets to uh, both adhere to a, a wound site and then um, aggregate to form a, a platelet plug. Um, Actually, I should have probably put this slide first. So uh, I mentioned before that the uh, ground squirrels, when they hibernate and then they wake back up, um, their platelets go back into circulation. And this is uh, an experiment we did early on. Um, the Mayo Clinic in Rochester is just about an hour from us. We cross the river into Minnesota and drive about an hour. And there are um, some research or uh, clinicians there uh, that had a thromboelastogram. And so I would collect blood samples, drive over, and we'd throw them on the thromboelastogram. And the way you read these, the x-axis is time and the y-axis is the uh, amplitude, which is a measure of the strength of the clot. And you can see in a non-hibernating animal, warm, high heart rate, uh, they form a clot very rapidly and it's a very strong clot, right? And this says um, the strength is partially a, a good portion due to uh, platelets uh, being there. In a hibernator, their platelets are reduced, their clotting factors are reduced. Uh, it takes longer for the clot to form and it's not a very strong clot. Right, and so this would protect them from clots forming under stasis conditions. Um, two hours after waking them up, so here we woke them up intentionally, started the stopwatch, grabbed a sample, ran over and measured them. And you can see that they've restored, they're not back to normal. There's still a little bit prolonged initiation of clotting and it's not as strong, but the clinician, um, he did the heart blood transplant machine. So that's why they were running all these. He said if this was one of his patients, he wouldn't be treating them. And which from a squirrel's perspective, evolutionarily, they don't have to get back to normal. They just have to get back to functional, right? So as long as they get back to where if they're up running around and got cut, they wouldn't bleed to death, right? So even though this, the bottom one here doesn't look exactly like the top one, if I think about it from an evolutionary perspective, they're back to enough protection to, to get by, right? Um, but these would be platelets and that have been in the cold for weeks that were getting released and still able to form clots, all right, and not getting cleared rapidly. Um, we looked to see if these platelets that were getting dumped back in the blood were new platelet synthesis. So we worked with uh, Martha Sola Visner in, uh, in Harvard, and we sent her samples, and they, we, these would be the platelet counts. So you can see pretty quickly within about two hours of waking up, their platelet levels are back to normal. Um, newly synthesized platelets took a couple days to get back up to normal. So these were not newly synthesized platelets. These were platelets that were being released from circulation, staying in circulation and, and functioning, which again would be not what we would predict uh, based on what we know with like rat or human or mouse platelets being stored in the cold. Um, we were able to show that they were sequestered in the liver. Originally, um, some people thought they might be in the spleen. We actually splenectomized squirrels and then let them hibernate and it didn't have any effect on their platelet clearance. So they're not going into the spleen. Um, they're being trapped in the sinusoids uh, in, in the liver and then being uh, released back again. Um, we also took uh, the squirrel platelets, uh, chilled them or kept them at room temperature and then transfused them back into the squirrels. And we did rats as a control and uh, the rats, um, you can see very rapidly the, the green line here were this um, rat platelets that were stored in the cold and more than half of them were cleared um, yep. within about the first 30 minutes. Whereas with the squirrels, especially if we look at the numbers here, we don't see any difference in the rate of clearance, whether they were stored in the warm uh, or in the cold. So doing transfusion experiments, it seems like they're resistant, at least on the surface to this cold storage lesion. All right. So they seem to be very atypical, right, for a from a mammalian platelet. Uh, 
Um, some other experiments we've done or some other things that are different with these squirrel platelets is when we store them in their cold, their tubulins don't depolymerize. And this is one of the hallmarks in human platelets. If you store them in the cold, normally you have the circumferential microtubular ring um, and you put them in the cold that the, the tubulin depolymerizes and now the platelets take on it more of a round shape. Uh, these squirrel platelets are uh, very odd in that their tubulin doesn't depolymerize. It forms these long rods. And these are some platelets that I actually sent two tubes of them to um, John Hartwig. Uh, he just, he's retired now, but he was at Harvard. And they were both sent to him on the cold on ice. And the one on the left here, he basically thawed them back out and, and um, sort of warmed them back up for half an hour, 37 degrees, and they went back to being round. And when he zoomed in on the ends here, you could actually make out the um, tubulins and they all kind of ended at the same point here. So we think there might be some kind of um, uh, uh, tubulin binding proteins that kind of extrude these. Um, but this is reversible. They can go back and forth from this rod shape uh, to a round shape. And we're still trying to figure out if that's physiologically relevant or just looks cool. Um, I'm hoping for physiologically relevant. Uh, but these are showing us here stain for tubulin and stain for actin. Um, so you can see again at, at time zero, uh, the actin's in green. I'm sorry, uh, actin is in red in the middle and the, my, the tubulin's on the outside in, in green. Um, we put them at four degrees, they form these rods. And then here we can start warming them back up. So here's 30 minutes at 37 degrees and then back to two hours. Those, those uh, tubulin reforms, right? So these were platelets that had been in the cold and that tu tubulin's not depolymerizing. All right, so th there's something structural going on there. This might have to do with the sequestration. It might be when they're in that rod form, they can get stored in the liver. And then when they go back to being round, they get released. Um, I'll show you some reasons we think there might be something else going on as well. Um, I know there's some people um, from the Divine Lab here who might be interested in cryopreservation of platelets. Um, so I've been collaborating with um, Jan Simak at uh, FDA. Uh, he, he's been looking at um, taking human platelets and freezing them at minus 80 and 6% DMSO um, for long-term cryopreservation. And so I've been sending him squirrel platelets. We are also looking at lipids, um, but these would be human and squirrel platelets um, fresh against these squirrel platelets must have been in the cold. Um, but the, when you freeze them, the human platelets uh, start to form all these microparticles. And he doesn't think this is apoptosis. He thinks it's actually just like um, the membranes aren't as stable and they're forming these little, um, they're starting to break apart. Uh, the squirrel platelets, you can barely tell the difference between the ones that have been frozen in DMSO and those that hadn't. Um, so these platelets seem to be very resistant, um, both functionally and just um, physically, just by examination uh, to, this, to these cold storage lesions. All right, so if we start then starting to tease apart the, the they seem to be resistant, um, we can put them in the cold and they don't get cleared any faster. They don't look that different when they come out of, back out of the cold and warm them back up again. Um, what about functionally? Um, so we've tried a couple of experiments here. Um, the, one of the thoughts we had was, is it a property of the platelet or the plasma or the temperature? So we did some mixing experiments where we took um, non-hibernating platelets from non-hibernating squirrels, so weren't in the cold, and those that had been just came out of hibernation. So they're about, um, they've been in the cold for a couple of weeks, and then we pelleted the platelets and then mixed them back with each other's plasma. So is, it, is there something in the plasma or was it the platelets? And then stored them at room temp or cold. And here we are just looking at von Willebrand's binding. So we're looking at glycoprotein 1B activity. And um, we saw that the non-hibernating, I'm sorry, the, the platelets from animals that had been hibernating bound less von Willebrand's factor. So it seems like they're less sticky, right? So it didn't matter which plasma we had them in, what temperature we stored them at. Once they've been in cold storage for a while, they're not binding as much uh, to, um, to von Willebrand's factor. Um, so then we tried looking at this um, under flow. So we did some microfluidics fluidics experiments with uh, Keith Neves. He was at the Colorado School of Mines at the time. And so here you have a microscope slide with fibrinogen attached. The von Willebrand's factor would attach to that and the platelets um, to that. And um, in this case, um, um, actually, I'm sorry, fibrinogen, it would be binding. I'm sorry, this is 2B3A. I got it mixed up. We also did collagen. Oh, but with fibrinogen, um, we here where we're trying to determine, was it the temperature or the flow? So when an animal hibernates, 
uh, two, two variables are changing, right? Their blood flow is slowing down, but also their body temperature is slowing down. So we designed a system where we could chill the, um, the slide. And so we could get the slide down to 15 degrees, or we could warm it up and run it at body temperature. And then we could do, do two different shear rates, so two different flow rates. And we compared um, humans to the squirrels. And what we saw was that in the cold, uh, under all conditions, we didn't see very much binding. So there'd be less protein protein interaction in the cold, which might not be that surprising. Um, but where we saw a big difference actually was going uh, the, um, under lower flow rates. Under higher flow rates, we saw more binding, which might be, again, von Willebrand's getting extended. But the squirrels, we saw even less binding under the low flow rates than we saw with the human. And this might be some kind of protection, again, when these animals are going up and down in flow rate, even their, their body temp might have dropped yet, but their blood's slowing down. This might protect their platelets potentially from um, from forming these, um, um, from, adhe from adhesion. Um, this is just the raw data uh, showing that. So we would late fluorescently label platelets, run them over the slides, and then go in, um, and stain them. And we could look to see that we saw more uh, binding with the human than we would see um, with the squirrels. All right. So the um, last thing we'll take a look at here uh, with the platelets end was we we're starting to get an idea that these platelets were behaving differently. Um, so we started to look at the literature for cold storage. And at the time, uh, the major theory out there um, was one with uh, Karin Hoffmeister uh, looking at um, desilation of the um, surface sialic acids on platelet proteins, which made them now receptors for, I'm sorry, ligands for receptors on um, hepatocytes and uh, kupfer cells in the liver, which would cause them to get uh, cleared from circulation. Um, so and so we, we, I'll show you some uh, data from that. Um, so you could look at cleavage of these sialic acid residues here. Um, the other uh, potential uh, major source of these cold storage lesions uh, was clustering of uh, G, um, the glycoprotein uh, 1B receptors on the surface of the platelet, which could lead to um, apoptosis or something mimicking apoptosis. I guess there's still some debate out there if apoptosis really occurs in platelets or not. Um, but some of the markers you can use to look for apoptosis would be turned on in these platelets. And these could include uh, mitochondrial depolarization, activation of cast spaces, and um, phosphatidylserine uh, flipping to the outer leaflet of the, of the platelet. And we can uh, measure this with a JC1 assay. Uh, this one, we, we have some um, fluorescent assays uh, for cast space uh, activation, and then a nexin binding uh, to phosphatidylserine. I should mention um, here, we're going to use um, lectin binding assays that bind to either the sialic acid or the exposed galactose underneath the sialic acid to look at that exposure. So a couple assays here that we're going to try to see if we can figure out, are the squirrel platelets resistant to this cold storage? And that's why when they get released back in circulation after being in the cold, they're not cleared rapidly, right? Make sure everyone got that connection there, why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so um, there was a, a paper um, from... Um, Moritz Stola's lab uh, down in, uh, in Seattle uh, that looked at these uh, assays for the um, uh, activation of uh, apoptosis related pathways. So the JC1 for um, membrane deep or mitochondrial depolarization, uh, caspase activation, and then a nexin binding would be looking at phosphatidylserine on the surface. And in all these, they saw um, specifically the um, uh, nexin. Uh, they saw a, a pretty substantial increase over time. And the phosphatidylserine on the surface, I have to interpret a little bit of the caveat that it could also be partially uh, caused by uh, activation of the platelets. They'll also see phosphatidylserine on the surface. Um, we usually measure fibrinogen binding as well as kind of a control there for activation. Um, and then they would see an increase in the cold storage here, increase in JC1 uh, activity and some over time, some increase in uh, caspase activity. So we went back then and replicated these experiments um, with the squirrels. Um, this one I gave you kind of a little bit of a messier slide just because there was so much data. The take home message here was we saw a little bit of decreased mitochondrial depolarization in the cold. So if I look down here in the ground squirrels, uh, when we stored them in the cold, we did not see the depolarization that we saw with the humans, but it wasn't the JC1 data is the, I'm probably the least uh, confident in. And uh, they, we also saw again with the humans, it wasn't as clear a story. Um, the phosphatidylserine, I think this is 
bi binding on the surface. This is where I think we saw um, some interesting results. So we always run human as a control and compare it to published studies, not just to replicate their work, but to convince ourselves that we can do the assay so that when we, when we see it in the squirrels, we, we believe it. So I'm not trying to like, you know, disprove or prove um, uh, Maritza's work. Um, but here, they again, they saw a very steady increase in binding in the cold. We saw the same thing here, a pretty dramatic increase in the cold, the white bars uh, compared to human platelets stored at room temperature. The squirrels were the exact opposite, right? So in the squirrels, again, we saw over time at room temperature, um, increased phosphatidyl serine exposure on the surface, but in the cold, there was almost none. Um, and so they seem to be, at least in that assay, uh, fairly resistant to those cold, that type of cold storage um, lesion. Um, similarly here with the caspase activation, um, with humans in the cold, we saw more caspase activation over time. In the squirrels, we actually saw less. And I should mention here, the squirrels actually at room temperature go up faster than the human, uh, but the squirrel uh, lifetime in plasma or half-life in plasma is about half that of a human. So if we do turnover studies with squirrel or rat or mouse, they'll be about four to five days compared to human, which are more like I think seven or 10 days. I don't remember human as well. Um, but human platelets last longer in general. So this that part wasn't surprising uh, to us. So in both of these assays, at least, the squirrel platelets seem to be um, uh, fairly resistant. Uh, if we go back to the other side of these cold storage lesions, the um, uh, uh, release of surfix, surface uh, sialic acid residues, um, if we look at uh, ricin binding on the surface here, again, with uh, the um, humans, here, we're, um, we didn't see the results that uh, Karen Hoffmeister's group saw with a big increase in humans going at four degrees, but the squirrels, we saw less um, desilation either way. Again, I'm not as confident in these results, um, but we did take them then and try feeding them to hep G2 cells, and the human platelets were cleared more rapidly when they were stored in the cold uh, compared to, hum to squirrel platelets stored in the cold. And the final thing I'll, I'll mention, we went back to, we're still trying to figure out what this rod shape might be doing. And one thought might be that if it's a great big rod, uh, it blocks phagocytosis. It's really, it's like an asbestos fiber. It can't get eaten. Um, and we can actually lock them in that rod shape by uh, uh, treating the platelets with taxol. So it, prevent, it blocks um, uh, tubulin deep uh, polymerization. And so we could, if we lock them, if we add taxol and lock them in that rod shape, um, they're, they're not cleared as rapidly either. Um, so they seem to be, I, I believe the apoptosis results more than the uh, surface gly, um, glycosylation studies, um, but they do seem to be resistant to at least some of those uh, aspects of, of cold storage. Um, so we did do a bone marrow transcriptome at one point to try to look at megakaryocyte markers to see if they go up or down. Um, we didn't see anything obvious in like P-selectin or 2B, 3A or 1B or any of those um, proteins. But the problem with bone marrow is you got about 30 cell lines in there and 90% of your protein you get is um, a hemoglobin A and B. <laughs> so uh, we worked with uh, Joe uh, Aslan down at uh, Oregon, Oregon uh, Health Science University. I always have to get them all straight there. Uh, and they do a platelet proteomics. And um, so we did a platelet proteome then where we took uh, animals in the fall. So they're doing this ischemic preconditioning. They're starting to get to go into torpor. Uh, animals in torpor, and then uh, summer alert animals. And then they go through and do all sorts of fancy uh, mass spec, and then some bioinformatics people who are a lot smarter than me give me these principal component graphs. But what was interesting, um, and, and they, they commented on this as well, they've done a lot of these platelet proteomes. They said they rarely see this tight of grouping. I mean, this, this level of um, separation between uh, the proteins. So there's something very fundamentally different about these platelets in their proteomes at these different um, uh, stages during the hibernation cycle. And when we went through and just, again, the biggest picture looking at what was going on there, um, in the winter, we actually saw a lot of, and I should mention, we take these platelets, we wash them several times, you know, pellet them down several times, we have inhibitors in there. Um, we are still seeing quite a few um, plasma proteins and lipoproteins in there. And I should mention when these squirrels hibernate, we basic, they basically are fasting for six months. They're not eating for six months, but they're living off of their body fat. And so they have huge amounts of fat in their blood. When we get a blood sample from them, the plasma is white. I mean, it looks like cream um, because they're basically just mobilizing all of this stored fat. Um, and so some of this could just be 
stuck on the surface, but when we did some microscopy, we actually saw some of this getting internalized as well. And they might be using it as a, a fuel supply um, or something like that, we're not sure. Um, they also had proteins that would suppress in, uh, thrombosis and apoptosis, and a lot of increased uh, translation uh, machine, ribosomal proteins and things like that were up uh, dramatically. In the summer animals, we saw relative to the others, we saw a lot more chaperone proteins, which might make sense they don't need them in the winter because they don't have to deal with heat related protein uh, misfolding. That's not to say they're overexpressed in the summer, they might be underexpressed in the, in the winter or fall. Um, and then finally in the fall, as they're getting ready to go into torpor, we saw less pro-inflammatory and clotting proteins. Um, and again, here they're going through, um, I always kind of think of it as like a, a metabolic or temperature washing machine. You know, they're coming from being awake and really warm to being cold and they'll go back and forth like this a lot, right? So from physiological perspective, their proteins and their cells need to be adapted to very dramatic changes, like much more than we'd ever see um, in a human. So they they're, might be getting themselves ready for going into this torpid state in the fall. Um, one of the other things we looked at as we compared the squirrel platelet proteome to a human platelet proteome to see where there's some differences between the two. And these were some proteins that came out in the, in the um, proteome and then with the, they were confirmed by immunoblot. And so you can maybe find your favorite protein on here. Oh, actually, yeah, the CD36, this was the one that was, I think I told someone the wrong number. This was the one that was the um, uh, oxidized LDL um, uh, scavenger receptor. So the human platelets have it, squirrels don't. Um, so we're doing some experiments to try to figure that out. Uh, PAR1, uh, this is like it, mice don't have it. So that wasn't as surprising. Um, uh, P38 is a, a kinase uh, protein. Um, and it's been shown to be, if you decrease it, it can decrease um, apoptosis. So there are a bunch of proteins here that were candidates that could protect the squirrel platelets. And then you could maybe look at inhibitors of those to see if they would protect, uh, potentially protect human platelets. Um, so the final thing with the proteomes, we didn't see any changes in, again, like a lot of the recept surface receptors, um, selectin, all these um, integrins, things like that. Um, so one of the issues there is the, the, the actual proteins that the platelets have might be the same. Maybe it's the activation of the pathways that's different. And you could go through every pathway and try inhibitors and immunoblots, and I don't have the time or money to do that. Um, so I've been talking to Joe about doing a, um, a platelet fossil proteome and a metabolome. So those are our next two things we're gonna to try to look at. So are there second messengers or, or um, uh, uh, intermediary molecules in the platelets that are going up or down uh, at different stages? And also are there uh, cascades of proteins uh, um, that are being activated or not activated as protections? And then we can go and follow up uh, and, and experiment on those. So that's kind of where we are so far with the platelet study. And again, I think there's some there's something there in terms of the cold storage. We just haven't totally figured it out yet, which is why you keep doing research. Um, uh, the secondary uh, hemostasis and fibrinolysis, we aren't working on as much, but I'll just summarize it because I know there's some people out there that find this stuff um, interesting. And we did find interesting results in all these. So if you remember, uh, secondary hemostasis uh, was suppressed, uh, specifically factors eight, factor nine, and von Willebrand's factor. In fibrinolysis, uh, we actually saw a bit of an increase. And here we use some assays that are common clinical assays. So this is a very simplified version of, of clotting. I know a lot of pre-med students wish this is all we taught them. Um, but, uh, so, um, but these are some of the markers we can look for to, to look to see if, if clotting or fibrinolysis has been activated. So we can look for thrombin complexes with antithrombin or TAT complexes. Um, if fibrinolysis is being activated, we'll start seeing increases in TPA PI-1 complexes and also a, a decrease in PI-1 levels. And then finally, if the clots are forming and being broken down, we'll start seeing fibrin degradation products or, or D-dimers. Um, so those are, again, some of the assays that we can go and do. Uh, before, uh, so before we get to that, I'll show you, this was um, factor eight and factor nine, we just measure with traditional um, clotting assays, taking clotting uh, factor deficient plasmas and adding back the squirrel plasma to quantify them. Uh, the von Willebrand's factory uh, collaborated with uh, Veronica Flood at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and she could do these um, cool von Willebrand factor assays. So we'd first measured it just with immunoblots and ELISAs and shown that the levels were lower, uh, but it's not just a quantitative decrease, there's also a qualitative decrease. So in a non-hibernating animal, we see the high molecular weight multimers. In the torpid animals, when they're in hibernating, 
uh, their total levels drop, but they also lose all the high molecular weight multimers, which are the more thrombogenic versions. Uh, and then within two hours of waking back up again, they've dumped these back in. And I don't know if they're coming from endothelial cells or platelets where the source is, uh, but they're able to restore that von, von Willebrand levels um, very rapidly, both quantitatively and the qualitative version, the high molecular ultimers go up dramatically. And we followed all of these proteins out over several weeks post arousal. And again, you can see they rebound fairly quickly and kind of hit a more uh, steady level there. Um, for fibrinolysis, um, we did a pretty simple assay. I like simple assays because I can't mess them up too much. Um, we formed clots in uh, microtiter plates and then just followed uh, clearance of those clots, breakdown of those clots over time. Um, so here out to three hours. And so here we can see humans uh, non-hibernating squirrels. And then here we can see in these hibernating squirrels, fibrinolysis occurred um, more rapidly, right? So the, the, if a clot did, for, we formed a clot intentionally and then followed um, its clearance and it was able to decrease more rapidly. Um, if we look in uh, blood from animals um, in, in the summer going into torpor or then during hibernation, um, we see a decrease in thrombin antithrombin complexes. So fewer clots are potentially being formed. Uh, during hibernation. Um, so that would suggest again that this, the protections that the animals are doing to reduce the clotting cascade are effective. We're not forming thrombin, so we're not forming these thrombin antithrombin complexes. Um, similarly, the, the fibrinolysis part, I showed you fibrinolysis does increase. It's a little harder to tease apart, um, but basically we can look at uh, PI1 levels. So PI1 levels actually um, uh, uh, dropped during uh, during hibernation that can be uh, either decreased production or um, increased consumption. And we actually saw here that it was a de if we looked at RNA levels, it was a decrease in um, uh, production of, of PI-1, which would mean there's more TPA available, which means you can induce fibrinolysis more, right? Um, and there's a, when we're looking at the literature, and this is, I'm, I don't work on um, uh, DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. But in patients who have that, they're hyperfibrinolytic. And they, the number the, that they've come up with, it's the best way to predict that is the ratio of PI1 complexed with TPA divided by PI1. So that's what we're looking at here. And these animals, this would be an animal then that's in this potentially hyperfibrinolytic state. And the animals in hibernation, so in torpor or during inner bout arousal, are actually the value they show for humans in DIC is 0.38. And these guys are pretty much right on there. Um, so they would be, and if this was a, a human, you would say they would be in a hyperfibrinolytic state. So they suppress primary hemostasis, they subtract, suppress secondary. If those fail and they do form clots, their fibrinolytic pathway is they're ready to chew up anything that comes through. So they, they've got like backups on top of backups um, to, keep from dying in the winter, all right? Which is a good thing to do if you want to survive the winter. Yeah. Um, so the final thing we can look for, it, maybe all these assays aren't picking things up. Can we just find D-dimers floating around in the blood? And so here, uh, D-dimers are produced when plasmin chews up our fibrin clot. And we looked for those and didn't see any difference um, between them. Um, so to summarize everything on <laughs> big global, everything on secondary hemostasis and fibrinolysis, um, it seems to be suppressed uh, by, by clotting factors being suppressed, less thrombin antithrombin complex formation. Fibrinolysis appears to be uh, increased. And as a result, we don't see any change in uh, D-dimer production uh, at the end. Um, the final couple of things I'll show you just are, this was actually some of the evidence we looked at first, but uh, the final thing we could look at is we've done all these biochemical assays. Are there, if we just actually just go and look at histologically in organs from these animals, do we see clots, right? So pretty simple experiment to do, but still again, important one. And um, so if they were having um, anything like a deep vein thrombosis, what you would classically see in a human would be uh, pulmonary emboli, usually at these uh, bifurcations here, this is where the clots would get stuck. And we've looked at a whole bunch of samples and we don't see any major clots forming or emboli uh, um, forming there. Um, we haven't seen anything in the brain. And again, it would make sense if we, if there were big clots in the brain and these animals go through 20 inner bout arousals during a winter, they probably wouldn't survive the winter, but you have to look. Um, but the one that was interesting was when we looked at the hearts and in the heart, um, in a human, if you have a heart attack, um, you get some kind of hallmark 
uh, uh, features that start to show up in those cardiomyocytes. And these are um, things they call contraction bands, um, hyper eosinophilia, and wavy fibers. And what's going on here is that part of the heart that's not getting enough oxygen can't beat in, in rhythm with the surrounding parts of the heart. And so it's kind of getting squished around, right? Every, everybody else is beating in unison and it's standing there, you know, get, kind of getting beat up, right? And so it takes up more eosin dye, that's a hyper eosinophilia. And that's where these wavy fibers and contraction bands come from. What was interesting when we looked at squirrel hearts in the summer, it looks like normal cardiomyocytes as they go into the fall, and go through the winter, if we zoom in here, we start seeing these hallmarks of um, what would be a myocardial ischemia in a human. And we actually had a pathologist at a local hospital uh, doing uh, 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 scoring these for us and said, said that in a human, that would be irreversible. If a human got to that point, in fact, he'd only ever seen them in textbooks because they didn't do, you know, do necropsies on heart attack patients much anymore. Uh, this was an animal that had gone through that in the, in the winter before. So basically they have all these, what would be hallmarks of a, uh, a what would be a heart attack in a human uh, due to ischemia. And um, they recover, they, they can go up to a level that would be irreversible in a human and they can come back out of it. And there's been other work done on this where they've taken squirrel hearts and rat hearts out uh, in ex vivo and um, perfuse them and they can add uh, make them ischemic. They can add things like lactate and the squirrel hearts are very, very resistant to that ischemia that would um, uh, cause the rat heart to stop beating. Um, so they, they also, in addition to everything else they've got going on, um, even if they're not getting enough oxygen, uh, they're able to keep, um, uh, survive that, that damage. Um, final one here, uh, a bone marrow. Um, so uh, as you could imagine, um, when they, they the, their body mass will go from about uh, 150 to 200 grams uh, during the summer. They'll put on about 100 grams, right? So they'll, their body fat will go, uh, will go up about, their body weight will go up about 40% over the summer. Then they'll burn all that um, during the winter. Uh, we were looking at bone marrow to look at megakaryocytes, and we did see some decrease in megakaryocytes, but mostly it was because the, the bone marrow is becoming so chock full of fat. Um, and so these would be an animal in, this, in the summertime. This would be in the winter. This animal would have hibernated the winter before. So all that fat went away and they went back to looking like this. Um, when I showed this to uh, Martha Solovisner, she's a neonatal hematologist uh, at, at Harvard, the one who did the reticulated platelets for us. She said that the, um, this would look like a, 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 a newborn or a child's bone marrow. This would look more like an adult's bone marrow. Uh, but they wouldn't be reversible. So these squirrels are able to go to kind of what would look like a human adult, but then go back to more of the childlike state um, uh, when they warm back up. Um, but, but you can still find megakaryocytes in here. Um, it's just, I think they get squished out by all the fat. Um, there's so much, they just have fat everywhere. Any place they can stick fat, um, they, they put it. Um, so uh, the conclusions, um, again, I hopefully I've convinced you that they, they're, they're cool critters, um, but they have all sorts of different changes in their platelets that make them resistant to these cold storage lesions. They can suppress uh, clot formation and even have some ability to break those clots down if they do form. And uh, as a result of this, we don't see any organ damage um, in these animals after prolonged periods, like six months um, in, in the cold. And with that, I'll see if there are any questions. This was a paper we just published uh, two years ago. Looking, This is a, a blood vessel and these are platelets and that's it's supposed to look kind of like a burrow and then also a blood vessel. And then those are like the TMT markers up there. So it's kind of a geeky um, squirrel art, but all right, any questions? Yeah. Well Hold on one sec, one sec, oh, Cedric. Oh, oh, Cedric. I just want to remind people first to, first, I want students to ask questions first. Second, sorry, Cedric. <laughs> if you do have a question, turn on the, the light and then turn it off when you're done. Otherwise, nobody else can ask. So hang on to that question, Cedric. Question. Yeah. Hey, hey, Dr. Cooper. That was a really interesting talk. So thanks for sharing all that. Um, you commented on a lot of the different kind of morphological and the uh, different signaling pathways and everything that is in uh, present in the platelet during the cold storage and hibernation. 
Um, but can you comment on the precipitating events that would lead to, like, why do the platelets all of a sudden start accumulating in the liver? Like, what events really drive this, um, this platelet change before, to drive them into cold storage? Yeah, good question. So uh, first I'll say, I don't know. Um, but the, so we do know the shape change happens automatically. So we can take platelets from an animal, even in the summertime, if we put them on an ice bucket in like 30 minutes, 60 minutes, they'll, they'll all be in that rod shape. So I think that's just intrinsic in the platelet. Um, and, you know, they're not synthesizing any proteins or anything like that. And I think it also makes sense from the squirrel's perspective, because they don't know when they're going to go into torpor or when they're going to go into you know, about arousal, their cells just need to be able to respond to that temperature change. So there's something um, in terms of the physical shape changes, which I think would be really interesting to figure out if you're into like biomechanics and stuff, how does, how do these protein assemblages know it's warm or cold? and form this rod shape, you can make some really cool little devices that open and close in a blood vessel or something based on temperature. If you do that, patent it, let me know, um, be curious. Um, so I think there, so that I think is just inherent, intrinsic in the platelet itself. The, the signaling, uh, and so then I don't know why they go to the liver. So the one theory would be it's the rod shape that they just get, you know, instead of being little round things, now they're these sticky things. Um, I think there's probably more to it than that though. Um, cause it, and also why are they just going to the liver? Cause if it was just that they're long and skinny, they could get stuck in the spleen. So there could be some interaction with endothelial cells in the liver or something like that, that we haven't, um, teased apart yet. Um, we do know it, and this has been shown in multiple species that they, the platelet levels drop dramatically. And even if you take mice and you chill them down a lot, their platelet levels start to drop. Uh, I don't know in that, that case where the platelets uh, go. Um, there's a, a, a colleague in, um, in Holland who's been reproducing all these same experiments in um, uh, Syrian hamsters that hibernate, and they're seeing almost exactly uh, the same results. In terms of the signaling pathways, that's where we'd like to go next. Um, so we didn't see any changes in the total numbers, quantity of proteins in the, any of the signaling pathways. So that makes me think it's going to be more something like phosphorylation or something like that. Yeah. Uh, we're going to, we're going to just jump remotely. Walter, can you hear me? Yeah, I can Walter. hear you. Can you, can you okay, hear me? Okay, you're on, Walter. Excellent. Oh, Scott, I loved your talk and I've always enjoyed it when I saw you at the various Gordon conferences. So this is really uh, invigorating. I actually have a couple of questions, but let me start with the easy one. Um, so if, is there any change, for example, if you take uh, 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 the squirrel's platelets from cold to normal temperature within the platelet? You remember Andy Rarich suggested that there's actually protein synthesis happening within the platelet. Mm -hmm. So is there a change happening within the platelet? And, this, uh, and the second question is, is there a change of uptake of certain plasma proteins that potentially can go into the platelet as you're going from cold uh, to warm? The other question I had, well, let me, I'll let you answer that one first and then I'll mm -hmm. ask the next one. Okay, so we, we actually haven't measured the uptake uh, in stored platelets uh, of, of proteins, but we do see more plasma proteins and lipoproteins um, in platelets from hibernating animals. So I think there is some increase in uptake. It would be interesting. In fact, I was just talking um, with someone today about looking at labeling LDL and then looking to see if it gets taken up um, in these cold stored platelets uh, through like these scavenger receptors and things. So that, that would be an interesting experiment um, um, to do. I can't remember, what was the first one you had? No, that was, it, I, I decided to break it into pieces. So the next, oh, okay, one, okay, okay. The next one is what's known about the tube? Is there any differences between the hamster tubulin and the human tubulin? Why these things form mm -hmm. it, or is it an accessory? Is it some sub variant or something like that? Have you looked at that? Yeah, we looked at that years ago. We aligned the, um, the uh, ground squirrel tubulin with like human, rat, and mouse. Um, there actually are some Antarctic fishes that have um, uh, 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 um, mutations in there, or not mutations, um, variations in their tubulin sequences that allow them to be stable in the cold. Okay. Uh, and the, the squirrels um, look just like the human and rat and mouse. So we think it's actually a, a microtubule associated protein, probably. Okay. And that also um, uh, would be consistent with what we saw with the rod shape, where they're all kind of getting pulled to one end these microtubule associated proteins often bind to the end of the tubulins. Right. And if they were all kind of stretching in one direction, that would pull all the tubulins kind of in a line with each other. Right. Um, right. That's a hypothesis. I, I, I don't 
I don't know the answer to it, but it, we did look at the um, sequences of the tubulins. There doesn't seem anything different, which would also make sense because they need to work normally under 37 degrees. So they wouldn't want to be too different. Yeah, completely. And my last question, <laughs> of course, my favorite granule called the alpha granule. What do we know about uh, the, the squirrel's uh, granule content? Is there something different there? Uh, that would be a good question. So we did look at one of the, I just wrote another NIH grant. And one of the things we were looking at um, would be the secretome. So could you take these granules, take, take platelets, wash them, um, hit them with, you know, ADP or thrombin or something and look at what gets secreted. Um, so that we haven't done. Um, that, that would be a, a cool experiment to do. Okay. okay, great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Thanks, Thank you, Walter. Christian. Happy New Year. Okay, who else from way at the back? Okay. Uh, that was a great talk, Scott. Um, so I'm wondering for the liver platelets getting stuck in the liver, have you thought about P-selectin as a potential uh, mediator of that? Because in the liver, in humans, when white blood cells get recruited, they first start to roll along like P-selectin. And that's actually a platelet binding protein. So I'm wondering if that... I haven't looked at that. No, um, we do know that, that at least in the um, the, the P-selectin levels don't change, but yeah, I guess I don't know functionally if they would be different. Yeah, that, that would be interesting. Um, we actually haven't pursued this as much just because it probably doesn't have as much application to humans. I mean, it, it's interesting from a weird, it's kind of like a where's Waldo, like all the platelets disappear and then come back. And we were just trying to figure out where, where they were going, partly too, to show that it wasn't new synthesis, that they were actually being stored somewhere. Um, but yeah, we haven't really followed up on that, that part. Yeah. But that would be a good candidate. Yeah. If anybody wants, I can send them samples. You can look at all you want. So, yeah. Yeah, pretty much any animal. In fact, we're just working on a review article on this right now. So any animals that hibernate, especially the smaller rodents, they all show this. They show a, a suppression uh, in platelets. They also show a dramatic suppression in white blood cells, uh, primarily neutrophils uh, drop dramatically. I had a thought that that might also, in a, in a deep vein thrombosis, that um, neutrophil nets are a contributor uh, to that. So I thought that that might play a role, but they, they probably want to decrease inflammation as well. The activation of de infl inflammatory cells in the cold. So um, they go down. The one exception are bears um, hibernate, but they're not what we would, what a lot of people would call a true hibernator. Um, they don't go down as, as far. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get back to our other picture, but I'll just go back to the start. So I'm not distracting you. Um, so uh, bears will only drop from 37 degrees down to about 30 or 32 degrees, but even then they see a, a slight decrease in platelet levels and things like that. Uh, they'll they'll uh, drop in temperature. It takes about three or four hours uh, to go up in temperatures under two. Um, and so that's why we see um, true hibernators tend to be small because your surface area to body, to surface area to volume ratio allows you to warm up and cool down pretty quickly. If you are a 300 pound bear and you decided to cool off, it might take you a week, <laughs> you know, just for all that heat to dissipate. Um, so the, uh, tends to be smaller and bats, um, um, actually, interestingly, I'll, I'll, I won't get on too many tangents, but we, uh, there was a debate in the hyper, if I, go, I also go to hibernation meetings, um, there's a debate was the, uh, did hibernation evolve multiple times or did an ancestral species hibernate and a lot of others have lost it. And we actually see it in their primates or some lemurs that hibernate, uh, bats. Um, so we actually see it in most branches of, of mammals. Um, and um, so the evidence is probably that our ancestral species could hibernate um, the ancestral mammals and then it was lost a bunch of times. And also um, hibernators have retained what would be more neonatal or um, uh, um, quite, um, characteristics. So things like the brown fat deposits for non-shivering -therm thermogenesis, they just retain some things that you would have as a newborn, they've retained into adulthood and um, other species lost them. Um, so. Okay, I'm gonna just jump remote. We have a couple, but from Nicholas, can you uh, hear us? Nicholas, anybody? Okay, then we will go. Peter, gross. 
You there? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, Scott, Hi, great talk. Um, there must be a huge literature on hibernation and uh, lipidomics, but specifically, I'm interested if you've looked at platelet lipidomics in 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 these uh, critters. Yeah, we're doing that right now. So the uh, colleague that I'm sending the samples to at the FDA, uh, that's that's the area he's really interested in, um, is that he thinks a lot of what's causing that uh, stability with the cryopreservation are the lipids. And so they're doing some lipid analysis on the platelets. Yeah. Thanks. Chris, how old um, these, are these, these are chipmunks, right? Uh, well, ground squirrels, yeah. But they're but, the same thing as chipmunks? Uh, they're about twice the size of a chipmunk. Oh, okay. Yeah, but similar. Uh, the uh, main difference with the chipmunks is they cache food. So like when they fill their cheeks up with food and run around, they store food and they eat all winter. Um, and ground squirrels and woodchucks, um, things like that, don't eat. So they're totally living off fat that they've stored in their body. Okay, yeah, so, so I'm Australian. I don't know these um, subtleties of the, uh, the northern... A wild, a wildlife. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, how, how long do they live for? Uh, so we've had them in the lab for over six years. In the wild, they probably don't last that long. They're they're um, kind of a favorite little fat snack for all sorts of critters. Um, but uh, yeah, we've been able to keep them for a long time. And there's actually uh, really good evidence: um, animals that hibernate will live two to three times longer than a similar animal <clears throat> of the same size. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of thought on that about like reactive oxygen species and mitochondrial damage and stuff like that. So when you're in this torpid state, all those things are shut off. And so you'll actually live longer. Um, so, so the old squirrels at six years, mm -hmm. they're doing their sixth hibernation. They're doing their sixth hibernation. Um, do they have the same extent, the same depth of changes? So I haven't teased it apart in terms of the clotting uh, activities. Uh, so if we get wild caught animals, we usually don't know how old they are. If we breed them in captivity, then we do. Um, and so I, I don't know that. Mm. Um, yeah, that, that would be an interesting study to do. Um, again, if, especially if we're working with wild caught animals, we, we don't really know that. And we can breed them in captivity, um, but we try to, we actually like things being outbred, so which is the opposite of mice. Um, but we, I always figure if I see an effect, uh, a, a statistically significant effect with an outbred population, it's probably real because <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> there, there's so much variation to start with. But, right. Yeah. And then, so finally, if the the ones you have in the in the lab and the constant temperature and constant light, do they still start to show the pre-hibernated? changes definitely yeah so the the males will wake up about two weeks before the females uh and the main reason for that is their um, gonads have atrophied they've used up all their fat and so they have to regrow them before the females wake up uh, this is the fun part and then they have to they actually breed within um just a couple of days of the female waking up so they only breed once a year so that's the other downside with this animal model it's it's more like doing an ecology field study you've got different seasons um, and the reason, but the reason they only breed that one time of the year is the pups, if they were in the wild, the pups would have to get to be full size and put on enough body fat to survive the winter. So they don't want to breed um, too late. Um, but the males, uh, once they're done their thing and they're uh, about August, they're getting fat, they'll actually start going into torpor, even in August or September. Uh, the females, especially if they've been nursing, they've used a lot of fat for that they'll stay awake a little longer and put on a few more pounds or kilogram or grams, I guess, not pounds, put on a few more grams um, before they, they, they go into hibernation. Yeah. Uh, there was a question called in, uh, for a bit of 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 a bit um, yeah, so the, the, I guess I'll answer the second one first. So the, um, uh, the, these platelets, all these experiments we've been doing with uh, the platelets have been um, in vitro. So we've taken them out and we're doing these in platelet rich plasma. So these are totally outside of the animal and even the chilling part and everything. So, um, yep. So that part, it, it, the only thing that could be contributing that wouldn't be the platelet might be the plasma. Um, it wouldn't be the liver. Uh, there could definitely be a liver platelet interaction going on in vivo, uh, it, which I, I wouldn't be able to 
I don't know how I'd measure. Um, but everything else, all these other assays I showed were um, ex vivo. Um, the, the livers would be a very interesting organ uh, to study. So they have done some uh, transcriptome and proteome work on that. I've never seen any big differences in, um, in like clotting factors or anything like that. Um, I'm not sure what else it would do to the platelet other than that being the storage, the storage site. Um, but when we do get platelets from an animal that's, I guess the one time we have looked at uh, platelets from an animal that where the, the platelets were stored in the liver, where if we get the animals uh, the, right after they wake up and those platelets get released, when we do experiments on those, those would have been in the liver. And we don't see it, I, racking my brain, I don't think we've ever seen any difference between those and those we stored artificially in the cold. Yeah. Well, Scott, are, are some of the defects um, in or reduced coagulation, is that some, could some just be contributed to reduced enzymatic reactions at the cold temperature? Definitely. Oh, yeah, there'd definitely be some protection. Yeah, so they in biochemistry, they have the, the Q10 rule. So for every drop in 10 degrees, an enzymatic reaction drops in half. So if you go from 35 degrees to 5 degrees, you'd expect an eightfold drop in any enzymatic reaction. So I'm, I'm certain there's some of that. When we do our assays, we do them at, at room, you know, room temperature. So to simulate, we're, we're comparing, you know, apples to apples. Um, but the, uh, but even if you think about it, so let's say your clotting times, let's say it normally takes a minute to clot. If you slow everything down eightfold, it's going to take eight minutes to clot. They're sitting there for two weeks in stasis conditions. So even if you gave it long, a really long time, it, it's probably going to clot. And I think that's why they probably have so many backups on top of backups to prevent the clotting from occurring. It's just how long they're sitting in that, those cold static conditions. And have you looked at the vascular endothelium? Uh, the most would be um, those histological slides I sh showed you, but yeah, not, um, I haven't like cultured endothelial cells out of them or something. That would be cool. I, 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 had, I haven't done that. So yeah. There is a question from Cheryl, apparently. I don't know what that is. Okay. Cheryl Pfeiffer. You there? Oh, hi. Sorry. Um, I was interested in, I mean, this is just so interesting and it, it's a bit out of my wheelhouse because I, I, I don't study <laughs> hibernation, but um, I was wondering, you were talking about the ancestral hibernators. So I was thinking about what would be the potential benefit to platelets to not be cold resistant? You know, do they do they last longer? Are they more hardy? Or, you know, if it's if the platelets in humans evolved from a potential hibernator, why would they be be not resistant? To, or why would they be, you know, um, not able to be cold stored uh, as efficiently? That's that's a good question. I, I like flipping it around like that. I, I don't know. Uh, I haven't really thought of that before. Um, Anybody have an idea? We'll, we'll turn it to the class here. So, um, yeah. So, did everyone hear the question? All right. So, yeah. So, if the ancestral species could hibernate and platelets evolve, then why, why did they lose that ability? And it seems like they lost it across the board. I mean, rodents and humans and pretty much any critter that doesn't hibernate. I, I don't know that. That's a good question. Yeah. I think we should. Uh, there we are. Okay. I think we're going to have to wrap it up with that. I really want to um, thank Scott. I, we can all thank Scott. That was a fantastically interesting and great uh, presentation. And thanks for all those remote people from the East Coast-ish and uh, for everybody else who's participating. So thank you very much. <laughs>